G'day and welcome to our series, Thanking God for 500 Years, where we are looking at and celebrating that momentous event in history and including in that church history. These are extracts from the book Heroes and Heretics Abound, available on Amazon. Part 5. Reformation Comes to England. We are now in England in the early 16th century. However, Protestantism had commenced earlier in the 14th century with John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was the morning star of the English Reformation, who had a great desire to ensure that the Bible was made available to everybody in their own language instead of Latin. So a strong evangelical protest movement started with Wycliffe. However, in the late 1520s, King Henry VIII, as head of the Roman Catholic Church in England, broke away from the church in Rome. He broke away because he wanted a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, which Pope Clement VII refused to accept. Earlier that decade, in the year 1521, Clement VII had recognised Henry as the defender of the faith for his writings against Martin Luther. Pope Clement VII was known for his intolerance of Protestantism and Reformation, and his main method of evangelization was through coercion and force, if necessary. In the year 1531, King Henry prevented the English clergy from dealing with Rome under an Act of Parliament, labelling this as treason. In the year 1534, King Henry was made the supreme head of the Church of England by Parliament, by decree of Parliament. However, King Henry remained Roman Catholic in practice and in doctrine. He made Thomas Cranmer the Archbishop of Canterbury, the clerical head of the Church of England. Reformation in England, however, continued unabated. Thomas Cranmer was a reformer, and he was helped by many of the reformers driven from Europe by the Roman Catholic attacks on the Protestants. William Tyndale translated the New Testament into English, and this made a significant impact. Edward VI became the king at the age of ten and ruled for six years. He was well trained by Cranmer. He allowed religious freedom, and he published, with the help of Cranmer, the first and second prayer books. Protestantism and Reformation was fast gaining ground in England. However, there was a change back coming. Mary Tudor, Queen Bloody Mary, in the years 1553 to 1558 when she was on the throne, was a fanatical Roman Catholic and set out to re-establish the Roman Catholic Church in England. She put to death many bishops, including Thomas Cranmer. She married Charles V from Spain to bring all Christendom under Spanish power. In the year 1554, she resubmitted England to papal authority. Reformation was now taking a back step. However, Queen Elizabeth, who reigned from 1559 to 1603, was the daughter of King Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn, and she was not recognised by the Pope. She was not in full agreement with the reforming Protestants, but she did maintain Protestant leanings. And Queen Elizabeth I influenced preparation of the 39 Articles of Communion, largely prepared by Cranmer, which were less reformed as a result. In the year 1559, she became governor of the Church of England. She defeated the Spanish Armada with the help of Sir Francis Drake, who were attacking in order to bring England back under Spanish and Roman Catholic control. This strengthened the Protestant cause in England. The main issue in the 14th to 16th centuries, as we have seen, was the Gospel. The Gospel which declares that none but Christ saves. That is, the gospel is good news for all of humanity, that nobody can earn their salvation, but rather salvation is a free gift from God for all those who choose to receive it. 
This is a far cry from the excesses of church dogma to date and was much closer to the teachings of Jesus Christ in the early church. The main issue in the 16th century was none but Christ saves, that the gospel is good news for all of humanity, that nobody can earn their salvation, but rather salvation is a free gift from God for all those who choose to receive it. Back to basics. Back to the original gospel message preached by Jesus and the early church. The main issue in the 17th century, however, was none but Christ reigns. The Stuart monarchy promoted the divine right of kings, the God-given authority to rule country and church. James VI of Scotland became king in the year 1567, and he tried to re-establish the Episcopalian system, undermining the Presbyterian system. In the year 1603, he became the king of England as well, and became James I of England. The people of Scotland never accepted his authority over the church, and fought to maintain religious freedom. James and his son Charles harassed the Puritans and drove many of them out of the country to Holland. King James I, however, did authorise a new translation of the Bible, what we today know as the King James Version, or Authorised Version. And then there was the National Covenant. This is where the Archbishop of Canterbury, the clerical leader of the Church of England, tried to impose a new system of church government on Scotland. But the Scots rejected this, and many signed a national covenant to maintain the freedom of the Presbyterian Church. In the year 1638, the General Assembly of the Church of England uh, tried to establish who was the head of the church. The people led by Henderson accepted the king as king, but not as the head of the church. War broke out, and the Scots, under General Alexander Leslie, defeated Charles in the year 1640. In the year 1643, both the English and Scottish Parliament signed a covenant binding themselves to seek the reformation of religion along reformed lines. In the year 1643-49, to the Westminster Assembly of Divines met to establish a basis for a united church in Britain. The Westminster Confession of Faith became the statement of faith for the Presbyterian Church. And from this, various groups came about. Firstly, let's look at the Puritans. Many Christians wanted greater reformation in the church, following Calvin's model of church government and worship. These people separated from the Church of England altogether because they were still considered to be too closely attached with the Roman Catholic Church. These people formed distinctive groups embracing a greater purity of worship, doctrine and personal piety. Some went so far as to totally separate themselves from all other Christians and started autonomous local gatherings of believers. These independent churches were the beginning of what we know as the Congregational Church. And then we have the Separatists. These group of people, the Separatists, were persecuted by both the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Churches, and many were driven out of England to Holland, where there was a greater degree of religious freedom. They were hounded out of England by King James I, and then subsequently by King Charles. Many, as I said, left for Holland. However, in the year 1620, some returned to England and left for America, originally called New England, on the ship the Mayflower. They wanted a new land where they could worship God with total freedom and virtually establish his kingdom on earth. And by the year 1643, 20,000 people had arrived resulting in America's origins being deeply religious. And then thirdly, we have the group called the Baptists. Some of these Puritans maintained believers' baptism by immersion was also essential for those who called themselves Christian. This was started by John Smythe in an independent church in Holland. 
a remnant of this church returned to England and established the first Baptist church, resulting in over 300 Baptist churches in England alone by the year 1660. Next time we will look at the last of this series, the church in the 18th century being confronted by the age of reason and scientific materialism. Come back to Partakers, where every day there is something new to encourage your walk as a Christian in the 21st century.